Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Russia is rocked by another twin suicide bombing. Who will be Iraq's next prime minister? And Israelis remember Jilad Shalit. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. Twelve people, including a police chief, were killed in two explosions that took place in Kizlyar, in the Russian Republic of Dagestan, in the North Caucasus region. The double suicide bombings come two days after Moscow's metro was also targeted by a double suicide bombing that killed 39 people. The Russian government accused extremist groups in the North Caucasus of being behind the bombings. Following the two bombings, Russian Interior Minister Rashid Nurgaliev heightened the state of alert outside important buildings and public places in the North Caucasus. The city of Kisler in the Russian Republic of Dagestan in the North Caucasus region woke up to witness death and destruction caused by double suicide explosions that took place near the city's police station. According to Russian security, the first explosion took place when a booby trap vehicle exploded. Twenty minutes later, another explosion took place when a suicide bomber dressed as a police officer blew himself up in the same location as investigators and rescue teams arrived at the scene. The explosions show that the terrorists are targeting any location. I would like to direct your attention to all important targets such as movie theaters, schools and universities. You must obtain additional information about the armed groups. The explosions took place two days after the Moscow metro attacks that killed and injured dozens of civilians, which supports the theory that the Russian government and states are being targeted. The Russian security agencies said that Moscow metro attacks were carried out by two female suicide bombers who are linked to separatist groups in the North Caucasus. Russian Security Council Secretary Nikolai Petrushev said that they are investigating all possibilities, adding that gather intelligence indicate that some members of the Georgian intelligence agency have links to what he described as terrorist groups in the North Caucasus. The armed attacks on Russian civilian targets, including infrastructure and public transportation, come month after Daku Omarov, a leader of an Islamic separatist group in Chechnya, vowed to expand what he called military operations in Russia. Meanwhile, people are still mourning the dead and worrying about the injured. People place towers near the location of the two explosions. In my view, what is important is not revenge, but to make sure that the victims and their families feel safe in the future. The explosions in Russia have had negative consequences on different levels. Russia's 20 million Muslims are concerned that other Russians will start viewing them differently, especially considering that in Moscow alone, 3,000 special forces are now deployed. Wa'il al-Hajjar, BBC. The head of the Iraqiya National List, Iyad Alawi, told Al Arabiya Channel that certain political elements in Iraq are seeking to eliminate his bloc and silence Iraq's free voices. Alawi accused the Justice and Accountability Commission of seeking to ban nine winning candidates, including five from his list, from joining the next government, vowing to politically and legally fight the commission. This is a political technique meant to eliminate the Iraqiya national list and most importantly silence Iraq's free voices. For our coalition and the Iraqi people, it is unacceptable and we will fight it politically and legally. 
Meanwhile, the spokesman for Al Sadr movement, Sheikh Salah Al Ubaidi, told Al Arabiya Channel that the head of Al Sadr faction, Muqtada Al Sadr, called for a nationwide referendum in order to elect a candidate to represent Al Ahrar or the Liberal Party in the next government. The main issue has to do with the person and not the mechanism. The Honorable Sheikh Muqtada Sadr decided to hold a public referendum that includes surveying members of a Sadr faction and others. The purpose of the referendum is to elect a candidate that could lead Al Ahrar party in its discussion and debate over the post of the Prime Minister, who will preside over the post. This is our number one priority. What are his future plans? This is the second item on the list. And third, it is the level of public trust. These issues are the focus of discussion and debate. The key issue regarding the post of the Prime Minister can be decided through a referendum for the Iraqi people. Many officials who dominated Iraq's political scene for the past few years lost in the latest Iraqi elections. According to results released by the Electoral Commission, only 68 out of the 275 parliament members have been able to keep their seats. The following report by Majid Abdel Qadir sheds light on the most prominent figures that lost. Many officials lost in the recent Iraqi elections. Many prominent figures did not get enough votes to be part of the next parliament, including some ministers such as Interior Minister Jawad al-Bulani. The same can be said for Defense Minister Abdel Qadir al-Ubaidi and former Security Advisor Muwaffaq al-Rubai, Minister of Planning Ali Ghalib Baban, as well as the respective Ministers of Transportation, Expatriates and Human Rights. We hope that the new faces that won the elections will help the people who have been suffering from many tragedies. Some want to serve the country, but others do not want to serve the country. Regrettably, some of the people who want to serve the country did not win enough votes. Hopefully, the people who lost will win next time. Only 62 out of the 275 parliament members managed to keep their seats. The most important figures that lost are Parliament Speaker Mahmoud al-Mashhadani, Qasim Dahoud, the head of the Badr organization Nihad al-Amri, Sheikh Jalal al-Din al zghay Adnan al-Bajaji, Khalf al and Mithal al wusi the leader of the Iraqi Nation Party. His party and others, like Iyad Jamal al-Din al-Ahara and the Communist Party, did not win any seats in the parliament. We want qualified people to serve the country and its citizens. Some people work hard, but they can't do everything even if they serve the country and its citizens. We cannot applaud the parliament members. They abuse their access to public funds. They also use tribal relations to strengthen their positions. All of the people who we mentioned won some votes, but not a sufficient number to obtain seat in the parliament. They're still better off than the 166 candidates who only received one vote. This means that they voted for themselves and no one else, not even their wives and sons. Najid Abdel Qadir Al Arabiya, Baghdad. Afghanistan's cycle of violence has caused casualties among Afghan farmers. Near the town of Lashkargah, the provincial capital of Helmand, a suicide bomber blew himself up among farmers when they gathered to receive free seeds from government officials. Seven farmers were reportedly killed and 20 others were wounded in the blast. No group immediately claimed responsibility for the attack. Meanwhile, Admiral Michael Mullen, chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff, said that Kandahar will be the next goal of the U.S. forces in Afghanistan. Mullen added that the offensive against the Taliban in Kandahar is a cornerstone of winning the war in Afghanistan. While Mullen didn't specify a date for the launch of military operations in Kandahar, U.S. sources confirmed that the offensive will be launched next June. In another development, the chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff accused Iran of seeking to expand its influence in the region. Mullen added that he was informed yesterday of a large arms shipment headed from Iran to Afghanistan.
We must also look ahead to Kandahar. We must also look ahead to Kandahar. Despite our importance of Helmand, Kandahar is more important. Kandahar is the heart of the Taliban insurgency in Afghanistan. Half of the additional forces pledged by President Obama have already arrived, and more troops are continuing to arrive every month. They are coming to Kandahar, the cornerstone of our military mobilization, and our key to eliminating the Afghan people's enemy. A second war has been raging in Afghanistan for years, but has not been accomplishing its objective. It's the war on drugs. According to a report issued by the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, Afghanistan is the world's largest producer of opium, which is extracted from the plant opium poppy, known as kashkash. The report also listed Afghanistan as the world's largest exporter of hashish. The survey estimates that between 10,000 and 24,000 hectares of cannabis plant are cultivated in Afghanistan every year. It shows that there is large-scale cannabis plant cultivation in 17 of Afghanistan's 34 provinces. The report estimated the annual production of hashish in Afghanistan to be between 1,500 and 3,500 tons. The situation in Afghanistan was the focus of a meeting held between French Defense Minister Hervé Moron and NATO Secretary General André Fogh Rasmussen. Ahead of the meeting, France said that when the time is right, it will intensify its efforts to equip and train members of the Afghan army and police forces. The Afghan war was also the focus of a meeting held between U.S. President Barack Obama and his French counterpart Nikolai Sarkozy. The two leaders met for an hour and a half over dinner in Obama's private wing at the White House. Obama and his guest adopted a unified position on several issues, including imposing new sanctions on Iran. The two leaders confirmed that they will work toward overcoming their misunderstanding, which has strained U.S.-French relations since Obama's inauguration as president. منذ تولي أوباما للرئاسة Members of the campaign to free Gilad Shalit held a Seder last night at the protest tent in front of the Prime Minister's residence. The event marked the 1,373rd day of captivity for the abducted IDF soldier. Unlike the previous three Passover holidays, over which their son has been held in captivity, the Shalit family did not participate in this year's campaign Seder. Activists pressed for the release of the now 23-year-old staff sergeant, demanding that on this holiday of freedom, the government do everything in its power to bring Gilad home. Jewish immigration to pre-state Israel was blocked prior to independence in 1948. Author of The Jews' Secret Fleet, Murray Greenfield, wrote of his experiences as a participant during the Aliyah Bet clandestine smuggling of Jews against the orders of the British mandatory authorities. Greenfield told IBA's Ellie Walgalanter that one of his favorite memories during that time was holding a secret post-World War II Passover Seder for survivors of the Holocaust. We were on this ship which we had brought from the United States to, to, um, to Lisbon, and we were going to go on to bring up, uh, it was called Ali Abed, to bring survivors from Europe to Palestine. And when we got into uh, Portugal, we had to rebuild the vessel, and in rebuilding it, we were making it into a, 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 place, a vessel that's going to carry 1,500 Jews, and we called them bananas. We said this is banana. We didn't know, nobody should know, it was a banana boat. On the vessel was a young American uh, by the name of Duke Lagoshevsky. He was in the Merchant Marine, but he had worked in civilian life. He had worked in a Jewish bakery. And he looked at the calendar, he says, it's Pesach. And he said, Pesach, not Passover. And he said, we got to have a Seder. But we can't tell anybody that we're Jews. We can't tell anybody that we're having. So he says, we'll make it, the captain's birthday party. And all the guys got into the act, and we started to put things in. We got barrels of wine, because that was the best thing you could have. Um, he made some fake kind of matzahs. And, uh, and the Hugh McDonald asked the four, the, what they call the four questions he asked the, for the Seder. So it was a crazy thing. And, and the rabbi's son, uh, uh, Harold Katz, he, he, of course, gave a little dissertation. But all of it was done in a way that it sounded like the captain's birthday party. We didn't want to get caught. Uh, it was illegal. And uh, 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 the, the, the Shushu boy, when I say Shushu boy, I mean the Palestinian. The Jew from Palestine, who was a member of, of the group that really knew what was going on, 
he came from a kibbutz, yeah, we are Hoshua Baharav, the Shushu boy, he kept saying, Sha, Sha to us. And that's how the Jews, that's how we started calling all these uh, boys on the ship, the Palestinians, we called them the Shushu boys, from his Sha, Sha. And uh, there we were, and the, the wine flowed, the matzah wasn't matzah, the four questions weren't the four questions, but the fact is, is that everybody knew what was going on within our little group. And the next day, the police said, what kind of a birthday party did you have there? You drank so much. We said, well, you know, it's not every day the captain has a birthday party. Of course, we didn't tell him who the captain was because we didn't have one. وأهلا ومرحبا بكم في هذه البرمجة الخاصة التي نلتقي فيها. We welcome you to this special program in which we will meet presidential candidates for the fifth and final time before the elections. An agreement was reached between the electoral commission and the candidates to give each one of them an additional half hour of airtime. Today we talk with a new National Democratic Party presidential candidate, Noreen Sheikh Din Ajallab. We welcome you, Sheikh Din. The new National Democratic Party nominated you, and you are the president of that party. We would like to know more about the party and its platform. Why did you establish it? We established the new National Democratic Party after a thorough study of Sudanese history. As we said earlier, Sudan gained its independence in 1956, and it has not been stable since. We thought that a party that represents a new political vision and platform must be established. Were you in another party before that? Yes, I was in the National Sudanese Party, which was led by the late brother Faria Abbas Gabush. May God have mercy on his soul. However, we now have a new political understanding. The new National Democratic Party is based on four ideologies. One of them is social justice. Sudan is a big country with a surface area of more than one million square meters. It is very diverse in terms of cultures, ethnicities, languages and religions. A country like Sudan with these complexities must have social justice. We are referring to civil liberties, all people must be equal. Otherwise, Sudan will never have peace and stability. Also, we think that democracy, which others call shura, will provide freedoms for everyone. Everyone must have the freedom of expression, religion, organization and movement. These civil liberties must be established in Sudan. If one group violates the rights of others, then it must be punished according to the law. While well, U.S. media reports say an Iranian scientist who has been missing since June has defected to the United States. ABC News quoted American security officials as saying Shahram Amiri has been resettled in the United States and is helping the CIA counter Iran's nuclear program. The report claims the defection has been the result of a wide CIA operation. Amiri disappeared in Saudi Arabia during Hajj pilgrimage in June. Iranian authorities, including Foreign Minister Manuchair Mutaki, had accused Riyadh and Washington of abducting Amiri. Now, the United States denied any involvement and said it knew nothing about the whereabouts of the Iranian scientists. Observers believe the report supports Iran's position that the U.S. was involved in Amiri's disappearance. Amiri worked at Tehran's Malik Ashtar University. The faction of Iraq's top cleric, Murtada al-Sadr, is calling for a nationwide referendum to decide who to support as the next prime minister. Sadr's officials have announced five names among them, the incumbent prime minister, Nuri al-Maliki, and former prime minister, Ayat Alawi and Abraham al-Jafari. Now, the proposal comes after legislative elections earlier this month gave Ayat al-Alawi's Iraqia bloc a narrow lead over Maliki's state of law coalition. Sadris say they will accept the outcome of the referendum, which they believe would make it easier for them to choose who to back as Iraq's next prime minister. The vote is to be held on Friday and Saturday.
Well, Syria's President Bashar al-Assad has met with Lebanon's Druze leader, Walid Jamblat, ending a five-year rift between the two Arab countries. Now, details of the meeting have not as yet been released. Jamblat has been a loud voice against Syria since the 2005 assassination of former Lebanese Premier Rafiq Hariri. The Druze leader blamed Damascus for the assassination. Now, Syria has repeatedly rejected the accusation. Before the meeting, Jumblatt said good ties with Syria are key to Lebanon's security and would empower his party. Lebanon's Hezbollah movement, too, has welcomed reconciliation between the Druze and Damascus. Well, staying in the Middle East, Palestinians in Israel have attended a ceremony marking the 34th anniversary of Land Day. Press TV's Shireen Yassin has more for us on this story. Thousands of Palestinians marched in the Arab town of Sakhnin in Israel. They carried black placards and Palestinian flags and called on Israel to stop its confiscation of Palestinian land. Mosques throughout the northern city called on worshippers to participate in the rally, and churches rang bells of mourning for the deaths of six activists who died protesting the confiscation of their lands. Israel confiscated 80% of our land by law, but these laws are illegitimate, unjust, and uh, we have the right to demand uh, our land back. Our land was taken from us and given to the Jews. This is uh, racism, even colonial racism. In 1976, Israel declared its intention to expropriate lands in the Galilee for official use, affecting some 4,000 hectares of land between the Arab villages of Sakhnin and Arraba. A general strike was announced from the Galilee to the Negev, and six Arabs were killed by Israeli army and police who tried to contain the protests. About 100 were wounded and hundreds more arrested. Israel's confiscation of Arab land is still a matter of great concern for Palestinians. In the land day, we stand together, all the Arab Palestinian citizens in Israel, with their, uh, with their people, with, the, with their Palestinian people, to say no to the occupation, no to the settl settlers and settlements. Every year, Arabs in Israel use such events to call for equal rights with the Jewish residents, something they say has been denied to them. Fifty years after what is called Israeli citizenship was thrust upon them, Arabs still feel the harsh discriminations. Once racists were in the street, now they are in the government, deputy prime minister, foreign minister, home minister. We are facing unequal dealing with us as citizens. That's why we are struggling in both levels, political and national. Land Day is also commemorated in the rest of the Palestinian territories where land is confiscated for settlement construction. 34 years on and Palestinians still gather up here to break their silence in front of Israel's policies against the Arab residents in Israel. Palestinians say that they want their rights to be recognized and their lands preserved. Shirin Yassin, Press TV, Sakhnin. As part of regional cooperation efforts, the Administrative Council of the Sahara and Sahel Observatory opened its 13th sessions in Algeria. Water Resources Minister Abdel Malik Silal hosted the session. In attendance were the Secretary General of the Arab Maghreb Union, Habib bin Yahya, the Chief of the Observatory Analysis and Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development, Nahdir Ahmeda, representative from Observatory Council members, states and member of experts. The session will evaluate the performance of the Council and its achievements in the last year. It will study environmental protection and natural disaster readiness. It will also research upgraded techniques for environmental cooperation within the South and between the North and the South. The desert constitutes a large part of the African continent. 46% of the land here is threatened by desertification. For most African countries, the difficult natural conditions have caused environmental problems and severe economic crises. The African economy is based on agriculture, and agriculture is linked to water and soil. These two natural resources are getting drained, and their availability remains low. So there is no development in Africa. Human beings and nature are in the same situation. The phenomena of drought and desertification are so dominant in a poor continent like Africa that cooperation within the South required additional policies with the northern coast. These policies were set up in order to face the results of climate change.
Environmental problems transcend all borders. Indeed, the climate has changed, so it is necessary to transcend regional borders and cooperate in the fields of science and technology. Even with the joint projects of extracting underground water, the lack of water and the low quality of water transportation installations in Africa impede development and affect food safety. There are other larger projects, including the so-called Daif Amthal, which includes eight countries. Among them are Niger, Mali, Nigeria, and Libya. Countries concerned with this problem should all participate in this project. It will be good for the region. When we secure the water in the region, we secure the water for Algeria. Environmental security is a vital matter in Africa. Its guarantee requires exerting continuous rational and tangible efforts and enabling efficient cooperation and dedication. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online, stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.